Hello everyone, my name is Daria and welcome or welcome back to my channel. A couple weeks ago, Miss Allie Hazelwood of Love Hypothesis and Love Theoretically and other big boy, small girl romance fame has come out with her first paranormal romance involving the union between a werewolf and a vampire. For anyone who is unaware, Allie Hazelwood kind of exploded onto the scene with her Raylo fic turned published novel called The Love Hypothesis. I wanted to mention Allie Hazelwood's history with fanfic because I feel like it provides like some context and like necessary exposition before I actually jump into the recap of Bride itself. Now for anyone who doesn't know, there's this very popular trope amongst a lot of fanfiction writers the Omegaverse, aka Alpha Beta Omega. When people were promoting this book, a lot of people were talking about it as if it were part of the Omegaverse. And the reason that kind of threw me is because the Omegaverse, the majority of the works tend to be about queer relationships. It's not to say that there aren't heterosexual relationships that are written about, they're just not as common. Like if you go into the AO3 tag and look up Omegaverse, chances are you're just gonna find a lot of gay shit, which is great, love that. So given that there is this precedent that when you use the word Omegaverse people are going to be thinking okay I'm about to read some like cool gay shit. I would not really categorize Bride as Omegaverse. I would say that it's just like a standard werewolf vampire paranormal romance. However it does employ some tried and true tropes that fall within or under the umbrella of the Omegaverse because yes there are subsections and sub tropes that tend to show up pretty frequently in these types of stories. Some of these subsections and like sub tropes include empreg, mating, and um nodding. Bitch don't get me started. We're gonna get there! We're gonna get there! <laughs> oh we're gonna get there because I have shit to say. And this leads into like the main reason that I tend to stay away from heterosexual, like paranormal and Omegaverse stories in particular because they tend to be very breedy. In those stories you tend to have a very like domineering, volatile alpha male and a more like submissive, occasionally bratty beta or omega woman. And these alphas are very obsessed with the woman producing a litter? <laughs> Fucking oh god, I can't do this. I can't take this seriously. I'm gonna be honest, this explanation is coming a lot from friends of mine because I was not an Omegaverse girly. I read one Omegaverse alpha beta fanfic. <laughs> am I gonna explain this? Yes I am. It was about the Korean boy band EXO between two of those members. No, I will not say which, although you're free to guess. And it was transformative? Is that the word to use? Yeah, I'll use that word. I read things, I googled things that I, I will not forget and have not forgotten. My 13 year old self was scarred that day. <laughs> So now that I've caught you guys up a little bit and I've given you that broad sort of context, let's go ahead and jump into Bride by Allie Hazelwood. So the novel starts off and we are thrown right into the action. We are in the middle of a wedding between a vampire named Misery. Yes, that is her name. Let's let that sink in for a few seconds. So yes, this wedding is between the vampire Misery and the werewolf alpha Low Moreland. I chose Jacob Ellerty in this picture because he just, he kind of looks like a puppy with that facial hair and that bowl cut. And also he's just tall. And that's, you know, Allie Hazelwood's, all of her heroes are tall. So we're in the middle of this wedding hall and there is just massive amounts of tension in this room because the vampires and the werewolves hate one another. Of course they do. There would not be a story if they didn't. And suddenly we flash back to when Misery was told by her father that she is going to be Lowe's bride. So this novel is set in like a modern kind of universe where everything is the same. We have all the technology and there is the human world, the vampire world, and the werewolf world or territories as they call them in this novel. 
and basically there is tension between every single one of these factions but the humans and the vampires have a kind of understanding and alliance although it's very tentative and the werewolves and the vampires just hate each other's fucking guts. So we find out that our main character Misery she is the daughter of a very high ranking vampire official. I just call him Misery's dad right here. I don't know if we ever find out his name and if we do I don't remember so he's just Misery's papa. And when she was young, she was made to be the vampire collateral. Now within this world, they have this collateral system, right? And it is meant to somehow ensure peace between the humans and the vampires. The humans and the vampires will like give up someone, typically like a relative, someone who is important to a high ranking government official from like the humans and the vampires. They will go ahead and like trade people and so the vampire collateral will live in the human world and the human collateral will live in the vampire world. And this is like some attempt at keeping the peace because you're not going to start a war with like the other species because you have a collateral over there and they could die and then all hell is going to break loose. And Misery was this collateral when she was very young. She was sent to go live in the human world. And this sort of makes it so that she doesn't feel at home in the vampire world because she didn't grow up there. She doesn't know their customs and their culture. But at the same time, she's not totally at home in the human world because she is, you know, heavily discriminated against and stigmatized for being a vampire. And obviously because she was the collateral growing up, Misery doesn't feel close to her father at all either because he's the one who sent her away. So in the present day when, or, the present day when she's older, but not the present day of the prologue, we flash back. This is confusing. I'm sorry. Basically, Misery shows up to her dad's office and he is like, listen, we are trying to broker some kind of alliance with the werewolves and we're doing this by getting one of our people married to a werewolf alpha. This guy, Lo Moreland, is a new alpha. He recently became alpha because he killed the previous alpha whose name is Roscoe. I don't have a picture of him up here, but you know, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't have that much colored ink to waste. Sorry, I'm broke. So Lo is this new alpha on the scene and he seems very keen to broker peace between all of the three species. And the biggest tension exists between the werewolves and the vampires. So we're gonna solve this through a marriage. And Misery's dad tells her that we had a couple people that we've talked to before you. You're basically our 10th alternate and everyone else is pulled out because they don't want to be married to this dude. Because, I mean, hello, he killed the previous alpha who was like virtually unstoppable and ruled for God knows how many years. He just like showed up one day, killed this motherfucker and took over. That's pretty like scary to a lot of people. Misery at first is like, why would I do you any fucking favors? I, no, like fuck you, bye. But she's on her way out the door when she hears the name of the alpha she's going to be marrying. Previously, she didn't know who this guy was. Then her dad says, his name is Lo Moreland. And this gives Misery pause and she's like, oh, you know what? On second thought, I would make a lovely 10th alternate. Put me in the ring. Give me the ring, basically. So then we flash back to the wedding and Misery is walking down the aisle. And like I said, there's lots of tension in the room. People are staring each other down from one end of the aisle to the other. And when Misery reaches Lo, there, he just like stiffens up and tells her, why the fuck do you smell like that? Now, personally, if I was walking up to a man and I was all dressed up, it's my wedding day, okay? I will likely never look this good again. This is all misery has, right? Cause she doesn't, she doesn't fucking love this guy. The only thing she's probably getting out of this is, you know, whatever ulterior motive that she has to say yes, but also so that she can wear a beautiful gown and get her makeup and hair done and walk down this aisle looking amazing. And and that's the first thing out of your mouth. Like I, I would be feeling some type of way, but I digress. Now during the reception, Misery learns that Lo apparently has a mate. Remember I said that mating is like a big part of the Omegaverse and paranormal romance involving werewolves in general. So Lo apparently has a mate, Miss Gabby. Yes, that is Gabriella Montez from High School Musical. Honestly, you guys, I had so much fun putting all this together. A lot of times I just like chose random people and characters that had the same name as the ones in this book. This is, I'm, I am very proud of this. Thank you very much. Gabby has apparently become the werewolf collateral. So in order to ensure that Lo 
doesn't like murder misery the second that she's in werewolf territory the vampires took in this girl Gabby and the werewolves are like okay fine like you can take our alpha's mate that way you know we won't kill misery you won't kill her you know we're all good misery also ends up hearing low talking with some of his men they call them seconds basically but he has like 12 different seconds so like I don't really get that. So Misery overhears them whispering. She doesn't know exactly what they're saying, but they're talking about Lo supposedly finding something or someone that he's been expecting and waiting for. We'll put a pin in that. We then find out the reason why Misery agreed to marry Lo, and it is because she believes that he has some connection to the disappearance of her childhood best friend and basically, you know, her sister named Serena. Now, I'm pretty sure in this book, Serena looks nothing like this, but I, it was just, I, I couldn't not do it, you know? Now, Serena was really the only friend that Misery ever had. When they were younger, Serena would ask her a bunch of, like, crazy questions about what it is to be a vampire, and they just, they grew up together. They're very close. But not too long ago, Serena suddenly disappeared, and she left no trace, and she also left behind her cat, which I feel like is a very important thing for me to mention. The cat. What about the cat? Also, don't worry, nothing bad happens to the cat. They are perfectly fine. They will not die. I promise, okay? I'm not gonna leave you hanging like that. Lo and Misery are now married and they move into werewolf territory. She moves into Lo's house. And this poor girl has barely been there five seconds. She's barely had time to get out a hey, hello, how are ya? Before this little booger, Max, a teenage werewolf, attacks her. Now, little Maxie, and trust me, he does not look this adorable, he pins Misery up against a wall and is basically wants to like rip her throat out because his parents were killed by vampires. So of course he has to he has to hate Misery because she's a vampire. I don't know, bigoted people, bigoted shit. I don't, I'll never get it. Anyway, Lo pops out of nowhere. And if you're just walking into the scene, it looks like Misery is about to bite and drink from Max because she's like showing off her fangs. Like, of, of course she is. She's gonna try to defend herself. Now, Lo shows up with one of his many seconds named Juno. And Juno is, like many werewolves, not a fan of vampires, so she automatically assumes that Misery was trying to kill Max. And Lo is kind of like, okay, Misery come with me into my office and explain to me, like, what the hell just happened. And when Lo listens to Misery's side of the story, he ends up believing her. Now, we just get a lot of pages upon pages of her like being at this house and interacting with like different werewolves there and one person that she ends up interacting with a lot is Lo's little sister Anna. The room that Misery is staying in at the house used to be Anna's room so Anna is always like sneaking in there talking to Misery. Like a lot of kids she doesn't really understand like you know cultural norms and biases already. She hasn't been indoctrinated so you know she she fucks with Misery and it's cool. And Misery too starts to warm up to Anna and one day while there is this like barbecue like sort of party going on she notices that Max is taking Anna into the woods and she's like okay that's suspicious so she decides to follow them and then suddenly they are like ambushed and surrounded by werewolves and they're Lo and his men seconds whatever you want to call them. And it turns out that they were all suspicious of Max and were keeping an eye on him and, you know, were watching him as he took Anna into the woods. Nothing was going to happen to her. And basically, this is when we get into some werewolf shenanigans and, you know, splits in the factions. So Lo and his pack believe that Max is part of this group called the Loyals. Basically, a group of people who don't believe that Lo should be Alpha, believe that Roscoe was the better alpha, still should be alpha, etc. And they are loyal to him and also loyal to his mate, Emery. I did originally print this out to be, you know, the picture for Misery, but like I said, Samara Weaving is just, she's, she's just a perfect Misery. Like that is probably exactly what she looked like on her wedding day. So Lo and his pack are interrogating Max. It's very, you know, standard Hollywood, you know, got him tied up to a chair, beaten up on him, trying to get him to admit the truth. And Misery ends up joining in on the fun, and she does this thing called thralling. You see this in a lot of, like, different vampire media. Basically, she can feel his thoughts, get into his brain, and get him to admit things that he wouldn't otherwise. Now, everybody in the room 
freaks out and they're like um you're a fucking weirdo don't do that to him even though they don't like max right now and are questioning his loyalties they still have you know more loyalty to him than they do to misery so she gets kicked out of the room and during that time she decides that she's going to sneak into lo's office and try to hack his software his computer i don't know anything about hacking or software so don't fucking ask me how to describe it but she is a tech girly once again with ali hazelwood you can never veer too far away from the stem okay she will always redirect you back misery ends up being caught by lo in his office and he basically like sits her down and is like okay what the hell is going on and she ends up admitting to him that she only married him because she believes that he has something to do with serena's disappearance or at least knows something about where she's gone and she believes that because when she was trying to find serena and was looking through her apartment she found the initials the name le moreland in her planner and when she heard lo's last name she was like okay yeah i'll marry this dude but it turns out lo informs her that those initials are actually the initials of anna his little sister and he ends up divulging that anna is the first known half werewolf half human hybrid i feel like i'm just like recapping the originals right now Lo and Misery end up coming to the conclusion that Serena, who is an investigative journalist, was probably looking into Anna and her hybrid status. And then they're wondering, well, how could Serena find that out? Someone probably told her. So who the hell else knows? So Lo and Misery decide that they are going to try to tackle this mystery together. Lo because he wants to protect his little sister and Misery because she wants to find out what happened to Serena. And they grow closer through this investigation and you know, Misery in general is kind of like warming up to people there and vice versa. Juno is starting to like her a bit more. And there's also this like one older werewolf that uh, Misery feels particularly close to and feels very safe with named Mick. Now, why did I choose a picture of Jake Johnson from Minx to put on my wall? I just think he's really neat. You know, and I and I think the long hair and the beard is even neater. Also, at this point in the book, it has become painfully obvious to me and anyone with a pulse that misery is Lowe's mate. Okay? I'm sure that a lot of you probably predicted that the second I said that, like, Lo was talking to his men about finding something that, you know, he's been waiting for his whole life and the whole, you know, why the hell do you smell like that? Another thing about the Omegaverse and werewolves in general is that smell is like super important. So you're like able to smell your mate and know them exactly like just from their scent. So that was like a dead giveaway. And honestly, at this point in the book, we're like barely a third into it. I was getting sick of it. I was sick of the constant illusions and hints being dropped that Misery is Lowe's mate. And I was like, oh, they're going to drag this the whole book, aren't they? Spoiler, you bet your ass they fucking do. I, ugh, I just, because <sighs> Misery is, Misery's a smart bitch, okay? You can't be a STEM girly and not have a brain, okay? I know that she is quick on her feet. She's smart. She's clever. She's funny. Girl, put two and two together. <sighs> Pretty much once a chapter, they're talking about the effect that her smell has on Lo. And she's like, oh, this dude thinks that I stink. So she's like constantly taking baths. And like anytime that they're near each other and he like kind of like flinches or has a reaction to her, she's like, oh, I know, I'm sorry. Like I smell so bad. Like, oh. and then of course I and everybody else knows that like, oh no, girl, like you just, you smell fucking good to him. Like he's obsessed with you. Like he wants to get all up in your armpit and the, behind your ear like you know oh my god behind your ear i sweat so much behind my ear that is like literally like number one sweat spot besides the under boob the book basically is like so much of the plot like is hinges on the fact that she doesn't know that he that she is his mate but everybody else fucking does and it it makes me so angry and by like it kind of like ruined the experience of reading this for me like at first it's kind of cute it's like oh like she doesn't know and he like likes her and like, blah, blah, blah. but ugh. at some point at some point I, I, get, I just get sick of it and it becomes a nuisance I'm gonna say this right now um <laughs> I know we've barely gotten into it but the like 
Serena mystery plotline, the whole thing with like the different alliances between like werewolves and vampires and humans, like the actual like plot of the book was so much more interesting to me than the romance parts of the book. Like I'm not gonna lie, the first like half of the book was very focused on this like plot line of like misery sort of being like initiated into the werewolf society and their pack and starting to become closer to different people in that pack and them sort of like trying to figure out what happened with Serena and like what who's on his birth parents like that's like a big mystery and I was like really freaking intrigued by that. And then the second half of the book we slowly start to pivot our attention to these two motherfuckers and you know what's going on between them but l i'm i'm skipping ahead and let's let's get back to the plot okay or whatever semblance of one that there is so one night during dinner all the pack is seated together and lo announces to everybody that he plans on going to the loyal territory and meeting with emery right here who you if you don't remember she is roscoe's mate and roscoe was the alpha that lo killed and of course everybody is like bad like bad idea don't fucking do that you are going to be exposing yourself and he's kind of like you know fuck it whatever um i have to meet with them i have to know what's going on with her and if i go there i want to try to like like hack into their shit and like figure out if they have any information what do they know do they know about anna that's something he wants to figure out and misery wants to go with him because she's like listen you barely know how to turn your computer on. When Misery is attempting to plead her case to Lo, they end up having like a pretty nice conversation about how they both kind of feel like outsiders in their own world. Misery was the collateral and never quite fit in with the vampires or with the humans. And Lo, he was actually sent away by Roscoe when he was very young because Roscoe saw his potential and knew that if that kid stick stuck around, he would, you know, overtake him and become alpha so lo was banished and sent away to live in europe and pretty much when he finally began to establish himself and have a semblance of a life over there he is suddenly called by his friends in the pack being like roscoe is like off his fucking rocker come here and take over and be alpha and he did misery also brings up the fact that she knows that gabby the vampire collateral is lo's mate and lo ends up explaining the mating bond to misery and the sort of like it goes beyond like attraction and connection like you feel like you physically have to be near that person with that person otherwise like your life has no meaning like you'll fucking die misery is like damn that that sucks like i'm sorry that you guys are apart i'm sorry that i'm a part of making that happen and this conversation once again like lowe's responses and the way that he talks about wanting to be like just the way that he talks about it again it's so painfully fucking obvious i don't want to pound on the door because everyone in my house is sleeping but it's just so obvious that she is his mate and i just i don't understand why a girl who's seemingly competent in every other area of her life can't figure this shit out i hate in books where they have to take a character and make them so willfully obtuse when that is not the kind of person that they are just for the sake of the plot like i there's nothing i hate more you are betraying your character for the sake of you know keeping some of the angst going at like at some point it doesn't become it, it the angst transforms into anger so lo eventually decides that yes he will take misery with him into emery's territory however before they do this they have to sort of make it clear to all the loyal werewolves loyalists whatever the f loyalists what is this fucking american revolution suddenly i'm imagining all these actors in like a rendition of hamilton <laughs> Okay. Lo basically has to make it clear to these werewolves that if they fuck with misery, they're gonna get the claws. And basically, this is just an attempt to get horny for the first time. So, um, and, 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 and paranormal romance horniness is, um, a certain kind of horniness that I, I don't quite get. And this is just an appetizer, okay? So basically, Lo has to mark her. And that entails him biting her somewhere that is visible. So like other people are like, oh, like that's, you know, that's his woman, his bride, his whatever the fuck. So this man starts like lapping at her neck. Like remember when I made the joke of him like licking behind her ear? He does it. It's not a joke. <laughs> he damn well does it. And Misery is like hot and bothered. Like she, she's into it. 
and then he turns her around and like bites into her neck and basically like holds her there for a second and um I mean I mean it makes me think of like um you know when animals will like pick up their babies by the scruff of their neck like it ju it made me think of that so Lo and Misery go to Emery's territory and of course things are very tense because why wouldn't they be you literally killed her mate and usurped his throne like I would be, I would be angry too they're at this dinner table and they have to find some excuse to get away so they can try to get to Emery's office and like hack her shit and so they decide to say that oh misery has to feed and they're gonna do that in private because none of the werewolves want to see that shit so they're in emery's office and suddenly they hear two of her like guards and seconds coming towards them and they're just like oh my god what the fuck do, do they do do we do like um and they decide that they're gonna you know pretend that they're like making out and get the hot and heavy in the room and lo is like you have to feed like feed from me right now and misery is kind of like thrown because typically like feeding from another person is something that's very intimate and very sexual and is reserved for the bedroom but they don't have a fucking choice so she sinks her teeth into his neck right when the guards show up and they're like oh shit my bad and they leave but she keeps sucking i need to establish once again that i don't really know a lot about this omegaverse paranormal shit but I do believe that it is a trope, this, like, blood drinking thing. Like, it's another staple of this genre, if you will. And I have to assume that because, <laughs> um, I don't know how to put this delicately. I don't, uh, <laughs> Miss Girl orgasms just by drinking his blood. Uh, his blood is green, by the way. <laughs> I never, oh shit, I didn't mention this. Vampire blood is purple and... Uh, werewolf blood is green. So she was like slurping up his, you know, sour green apple flavored blood and have a damn good time. It just takes that flavor and a little bit of dry humping and she is gone. And I, <laughs> oh no, oh no. My digital footprint is such a fucking mess. Oh God. Anyway, time to awkwardly transition out of that scene in that moment. So they go back home and Misery is in the kitchen and she decides that she wants to have some peanut butter. And with vampires, I forgot to mention this by the way, they don't like drink from people. They basically get their blood from blood banks and they definitely don't have human food. It's like, it's, it's like if someone just randomly started eating like mud, like it's, it's very weird to them. But because Misery grew up in the human world, she's, you know, become acclimated to it and she likes human food. So she's in there eating peanut butter straight out of the jar and Lo comes around and they're talking and getting kind of flirty and kind of close. And then suddenly Misery collapses and turns out she's been poisoned by the peanut butter. She like passes out. So we don't really see anything. She doesn't see anything, but she does hear like a doctor and she hears like Lo saying that he's not gonna leave her side and shit and eventually a couple days later she like wakes up goes to the dining room and sees Lo with like his whole pack and he sends him out of the room and is like I need to talk to Misery and Misery alone. I also forgot to mention so at some point during her like illness and recovery she ends up seeing Lo in his wolf form and he is a big fluffy white wolf with green eyes and I just feel like I had to mention that not that it's important but like I picture him looking like a Samoyed and that makes me happy. So as I mentioned previously, the peanut butter was poisoned and they basically figure that this poisoning was actually meant for Anna because she is the one who is constantly having peanut butter in their house. So they're like, okay, this shit's getting serious. Who knows about her and who's trying to kill her? And Lo ends up deciding that it is just too dangerous for Anna to be staying with them in their pack, in their household, because there is likely somebody here, a mole, a traitor within our midst, that is trying to kill her. So he decides to send her away to his friend Cohen's pack. And that, is that a fucking bug? Anyway, Cohen is the alpha of another pack and Lowe's good friend. And he decides to send Anna to live with him for a while, keep that low so nobody really knows. And he also wants Misery to go, but Misery is like, no, I'm staying here because you and I are a team and we're gonna figure this shit out together. Also, I feel like I need to explain something because I think I'm hilarious. We have the two Wilson brothers, right? And he's supposed to represent Cohen, the werewolf best friend, and Owen Wilson is meant to represent Owen in the book. And Owen, I don't think I've mentioned him so far. I don't think he's come up, but he is Misery's older brother. So we have Owen and Cohen. Similar names in the book 
represented by the Wilson brothers. So Misery is still recovering from being poisoned and she ends up in the bath and Lo goes in there and is talking to her and he starts like absent-mindedly rubbing her leg and Misery is feeling some kind of way and so she moves his hand a little bit further north. That took a long time for me to figure out. And suddenly before you know it he is lifting her to the bathtub and taking her to back to her room and it's like listen I need to taste the rainbow. Like it, it's a werewolf thing. I Like it's a physical need. Like on Maslow's hierarchy of needs it's some foundational shit. And you know who was she to deprive him of his needs? Like what I mean what kind of woman would she be? Come on now. So she lets him. Misery is feeling good. She is like hey let's get down to business. Let's do it. I am trying so hard <laughs> to stay monetized. Oh god, that's not gonna happen. Anyway, so she's like, bro, let's fucking do this. And he says, uh, we can't. And she figures it's because he has a mate, but he tells her, like, um, we are physically incompatible, you and I. Like, we, we, we can't. And in order to prove to her how physically incompatible they are, he sort of, uh, takes Misery's hand to begin shucking the corn. <laughs> god and um and while she's doing that she feels something we don't know what that something is i mean i know i hate that i know <laughs> i wish i didn't know and she sort of understands finally what he means by being physically incompatible i'm regretting making this video i wonder if i can just stop can i just stop no i i wasted colored ink on this shit i have to do this Misery and Lo end up meeting with Alex, whom I don't think I've mentioned, even though I've had his picture up here the whole time. Um, Alex has been there since the beginning, by the way. He is a member of Lo's pack, and he is kind of this, like, quiet, nerdy type. He is, like, super into computers, just like Misery, but he's also, like, deathly afraid of vampires. So at first, he didn't fuck with her, but, like, now they're, like, kind of friends and stuff. I also uh, chose this picture of Ben Winshaw from James Bond not because there's like a you know a funny little pun or any kind of name similarity just because I think he's beautiful and that's how I picture Alex. Alex reveals to Misery and Lo that he has found a connection between Serena and this man named Thomas. I think the reason for this picture is obvious. This guy Thomas was an important representative for the Human Werewolf Bureau and Serena apparently had a meeting with him and was going to somehow include him in an article and Lo and Misery end up sort of splitting off from Alex and they see this guy's picture and they're like, that is Anna's father. I mean, look at the resemblance. Thomas the human is Anna's birth father. They look exactly alike. However, the issue is Thomas is dead and he died in a car accident that was likely a cover-up. Misery and Lowe decide to pay Governor Davenport a visit and he's actually on his way out from the position. He is being superseded by a woman who Lowe actually is kind of in, not cahoots with, but they're trying to form werewolf human alliances, which up until this point the humans have only ever been allied with the vampires against the werewolves. So that spells some trouble, some trouble for the vampires because their population is already dwindling and now it looks like the werewolves and the humans who have much bigger expanding populations may team up and that is an issue for vampires. So they go to Governor Davenport and they go to visit him because he was Thomas's point guy within the Human Werewolf Bureau and while they're there they basically accuse him of being involved with Thomas's murder, I don't know why to do murder, death, which is actually a murder. I messed that up. While at dinner with Governor Davenport, they talk to him about Thomas and accuse him of being responsible for Thomas's death. And the governor ends up admitting that and says that, you know, Thomas knew about some embezzlement that he was a part of and he had to kill him. Misery and Lowe then meet up with Owen, Misery's brother, and Gabby. And when they're there, Misery is kind of on edge because at this point she is really, really invested in Lowe. She really cares about him, starting to fall in love with him. And now they're meeting up with his mate and she is just feeling really insecure and shit. But when she watches Gabby and Lo interact, it's very cordial. You know, there is obviously some care there, but not anything that one would expect seeing, you know, two mates interact. 
And while Misery is there, she talks to Owen, who tells her that he has a plan to take their father's seat on the Vampire Council. And this is a big fucking deal because Daddy loves his power more than anything else. And also that's just not how Vampire Councils work. You can't just vote someone out. And so this could likely result in Owen, Owen's death. But he's like, I want to do that. I want to broker peace between all three species and I want to get rid of the collateral system. So the four of them go their separate ways and Misery is just absolutely reeling at the fact that there seemed to be no like intense connection between Gabby and Lo. At this point Misery is starting to put two and two together like she's thinking about all the ways that Lo described how having a mate feels and like yeah she's starting to piece it together but at this point I don't give a fuck. At this point I was like kill it. Kill it. Like I'm sick of it. The two of them go to Misery's apartment in the human world and whilst there Lo reveals that Gabby is in fact not his mate and when they wanted to come up with a collateral you have to give up someone that you care about and there was no way he was going to give up Anna which was really his only option. Gabby volunteered to be the collateral and they just faked it and said that she was his mate and yeah that was it. She's not his mate. And Misery and him are like doing this like tiptoeing thing like verbally with each other like not really admitting that she's his mate but like they both kind of know. I mean she kind of knows now. He always knew. The two of them end up kissing and they get down to more horny shenanigans and I simply cannot describe this to you. One because I've, I'm like physically incapable of doing it. I just can't. And two because it's just so fucking hilarious <laughs> the way that it was written. Okay so this is the conversation. You don't even know what it's called he says. What does it matter she asks. Am I wrong? You don't know what you're asking for, do you? And then she says, just tell me then. Then I'll know and a knot. It's called a knot. Say it, low orders. And when I hesitate, he adds, please. She says, not a knot. <laughs> Is that not exactly the Twilight Wood scene word for word? Literally standing there being like, say it say it out loud. Here's how the rest of that combo went because I will not be reading the rest of it. I am doing all that I can to salvage my digital footprint right now. It's not working. I'm beating a dead horse. I'm fighting against the waves. I, I, it's over for me. I don't know why I'm trying. And here's the thing that made this scene so much cringier and worse than just like reading it on the page. I was listening to it on audio. <laughs> These motherfuckers were panting in my ear. I have never in my life been so embarrassed by an audiobook that I have paused it. I felt violated. <laughs> like why, why are you, why are, why, why, why? So immediately after all that, <laughs> Misery tells Lo that she knows that she is his mate and that even though she doesn't have that mate bond with him, she feels similarly. And Lo tells her, listen, you don't know what the hell you're talking about and also you're not my mate. You have built up this thing between us because you have always wanted to belong somewhere and with somebody and you feel at home with my pack and you feel at home with me and you've basically just been alone and abandoned your whole life and now you're trying to like glob onto me. <laughs> and I was offended. I don't even like this bitch that much and I was I wanted to deck him on her behalf. She even says this herself. She's like, he literally took the thing that I'm most insecure about that I told him in a moment of vulnerability and confidence and used it against me. I'm sorry, but if someone is willing to do that to you, even in an instance like this where like we obviously can tell he just like is trying to like protect her quote unquote from like having to be his mate or whatever the fuck. Even in that instance, if you're gonna use some shit that I said to you in confidence, that I was vulnerable with you, like I, I shared that info with you because I was trying to like build a connection and be vulnerable with you, if you ever use that shit against me, gone. Gone, bitch. You are out of my life. That pissed me off so bad. I don't know why, because like in the grand scheme of things, when you look at romances, it's not like the worst thing anyone's ever done, but it was such like a 180 with Lo because like throughout the entire book, I will say he did not have those like breedy, possessive, like really volatile things 
that I've expected from like heterosexual Omegaverse romances. And then suddenly he pulled that shit. I was like, ew. Like in the final leg of the race, you're just gonna trip like that? Anyway, misery is obviously miserable. <laughs> Oh, I just came up with that on the fly. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud. Clap, please. I'll wait. I'll wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Misery is just not having a good time, and she gets into a car ready to return to werewolf territory, and then suddenly she is injected with something by Mick. And let me tell you, I called it. The second that Misery said specifically, that Mick was one of the first werewolves that she's ever trusted, the first person to make her feel welcome within the pack. I knew this bitch was the mole. I knew it. So Misery wakes up in this room and who else is there but Serena? And Serena has been there for God knows how long. She did that thing that they do in a lot of like movies and shit where she's like tallied up the days that she's been there on the wall. And they have this like little reunion and shit and then they're like, we need to get out of here. So a young werewolf comes up to the door and they also figure that like Mick is in cahoots with the loyalists and like they're being kept in werewolf territory. So this young, this young werewolf comes to the door and Misery tries to thrall him but when that doesn't work her and Serena just manage to like use physical violence and like get out of the place. But then they find that they're not in fact in werewolf territory, they are in a building called the Nest which is where Misery's father and so many other high-ranking vampires live. So now Misery's dad goes on like a full-on James Bond villain monologue, which is why I chose this picture. This guy is like known for playing villains and also this is him in a James Bond movie playing a villain, so. So Misery's dad got Mick to play along with his plan and you know, do all the shit behind everybody's backs because he has taken Mick's son captive. And another thing about Mick is that he like lost his mate recently and so his son is like really all that he has and he's like desperate to like help him and save him, whatever. Misery's dad begins to explain that through his efforts, through his machinations and you know his relationships that he's cultivated with high-ranking you know human government officials and also by ensuring that humans and werewolves are constantly pitted to, against one another, he has managed to keep vampires in power despite their dwindling population. He's been keeping the collateral system alive and also has been bribing a lot of people, including Governor Davenport. He reveals that over the years he has been thralling the governor to do his bidding. And about 20 years ago, the governor told him about the existence of a half-human, half-werewolf hybrid, which means that that could not be Anna. And then we figure out that actually it's Serena. Okay, Serena is a hybrid. And Misery's dad has been keeping an eye on her since childhood. So he purposefully got Serena and Misery to grow up together so he could keep an eye on Serena. And Serena was adopted, by the way, and she had no idea that she was a hybrid. And in fact, she like presented as a human for the majority of her life. But recently, she's been having these like wolfy tendencies. So like her senses are heightened and every time there's a full moon she has this like desire to shift. And through Serena's research and her attempts to find her own birth parents, she found out about Thomas and the existence of Anna. So she discovered that a bunch of years ago Anna and Lowe's mother came to Thomas and was like, yo, I'm pregnant, it's your baby. And he obviously like doesn't believe that that's possible. So he was like, um, no, get away from me. But many years later, he became curious and he found out that Anna exists and Anna is his kid. And he came to Governor Davenport about it. And Governor Davenport told Misery's dad and Misery's dad basically thralled Governor Davenport into killing Thomas. So it was Misery's dad behind basically everything. After this little monologue that he goes on, Lowe is then brought into the room in handcuffs by Owen. Owen, I was I was so pissed. Honestly, I cared more about this betrayal than anything else that happened in the book. I, I fucked with Owen. Misery's dad then tells Lowe that he is going to give up Anna in exchange for Misery. Misery's dad holds a knife to her throat and he's like, listen, I've heard that if you kill someone's mate in front of them, they lose it. And they are like, they, they're, they're never the same again. And Misery is kind of like, okay, well, 
that doesn't even fucking matter because I'm not his mate. He told me so. And she's like, Lo, like, tell him the truth. Like, I'm not your mate. Like, it doesn't fucking matter if he kills me. And then Lo just kind of like, and everyone in the room is like, and I'm sitting there like, and it's, ugh, I just, I just, I've spoken enough about how much this pisses me off. Like, you already know. Let's keep, let's keep chugging. So in the midst of all of this chaos with the knife to her throat and Lo, like, freaking out, not knowing, like, what to do, Serena turns to Misery and says something to her in this, like, made-up language they came up with when they were kids and basically tells her, I know how to shift. I can shift. And Misery manages to tell Lo something that gets him to understand that. And, like, on the count of three or whatever the fuck, he and Serena turn into wolves and attack everybody in the room. Then we skip to the aftermath, which kind of pissed me off, to be honest. Like, I would have loved to have seen that battle and have just, like, read about how they, like, ripped people's heads off and tore them to shreds. Like, what is skip out on the cool shit? Lowe's pack shows up and they begin brutally interrogating Mick and Governor Davenport. And, thank God, we find out that Owen is not a traitor. Okay, he was only pretending. Lo came to him and was like, I need to get in there. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I need to get in and see if Misery's okay. So, like, that was just all a ruse made up by Lo. Thank God, okay? My man, my man is not a traitor. He is not a betrayer. He would never. Owen then confronts his daddy and tells him, I am going to undo everything that you have ever worked for or done in your life. I am going to broker peace between all three species. I'm taking your council seat. Fuck you very much. I love him. Like, that's that's my man. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, I, I just, I don't know if Allie Hazelwood plans to do a book about Owen, but if she does, I will read it. Like, I had no plans to continue with the series, but if Owen gets a book, I will be reading. So we finally come to the end of this book. The penultimate climax Pun very much intended. So Misery shows up at Lowe's house. And this is when we get down to the knots and bolts. <laughs> I'm a comedian. I am a comedian. I am, I, I entertain myself so much. I think I'm hilarious. So I've mentioned throughout this video and during the recap of this book that there is this thing that keeps getting referred to called a knot. I'm going to explain this in biological terms, okay? I refuse to read this shit out loud. <laughs> um, once again, I'm trying to save my digital footprint so bad. And you know what? I, 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 I'm just going to put up like like uh, uh, screenshots of, of what is said because I can't, I can't do it. I think the problem for me is that it is just too close to like actual phenomenons in nature between animals. I, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I literally don't know what to say. I cannot believe that I'm, my life has led me to this moment. Like, if you'd asked me, like, a decade ago, like, where, what do you think you would be doing on a, on a Saturday night when you're 25? Damn sure not this. <laughs> Damn sure not this. Oh. <sighs> anyway, let's jump to the final, final part of this book in which it's like a bit of an epilogue and Lo and Misery are together and they're happy and whatever. And Anna finally comes home after staying with Cohen. And Serena is there and Serena and Anna are kind of getting closer because they're both hybrids. They're the only ones of their kind that they know of. And so they're cultivating like kind of a relationship. And the book ends with Cohen staring at Serena and just unable to take his eyes off of her. And Lo is watching this and is kind of like, Oh shit. So Cohen is, I was gonna say imprinting. Oh God, that's a whole nother can of worms. Serena is Cohen's mate. And I imagine this was meant to set up a sequel, which I will not be reading. This was an experience. This was a time. This was a moment in the history of my life and I will not be repeating it. Thank you so much. I think that we have established that the werewolf stuff, the Omegaverse stuff is just simply not for me. It's not my cup of tea. I will stick to my coffee shop AUs. I love a Pacific Rim AU. Oh my god, I ate those the fuck up in the 2010s. Um, but this one's not for me. Not for me. That is it for me today, you guys. That has to be it for me today, you guys. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I was gonna say as much as I enjoyed making it, but I I honestly don't know if this video is gonna see the light of day. <sighs>
If you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below. Go ahead and let me know if you read this book and what you thought of it. If you didn't read it, what did you think of my recap? And, and what did you think of my choice of pictures? If you guys want to find me or follow me anywhere else, all of my links will be down below. I love you all so very dearly, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye!